Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started with uh, GI radiology, very similar to uh, prior lecture. We'll start off with a quiz and then review basics radiology based on the AMSTER guidelines. The AMSTER guidelines is the national guidelines for what medical students should know about radiology uh, during medical school. It's interactive as before. What is the positioning in red? PA, anterior posterior, right anterior oblique, left anterior. Okay, so Maggie thinks um, AP. Okay, the consensus is AP, great. What are the arrows pointing to? The bladder, the stomach, uterus, colon. Okay, so the consensus is bladder, good. What is marked in green arrow over here on the right? This is the normal image on the left, free air. Great. And what is this radio pig catheter here? It's a pick line. Good. And is it in the right place? Yes. So pick line should be in the central region around the SEC. Uh, if it's up here by the brachiocephalic, that's too proximal. And the reason that's a problem is because if you inject chemotherapy, you can sclerose the veins if, it's, if the caliber of the vein is not large. So you need high flow. And if it's too deep in the right atrium, for example, it, it can cause arrhythmias because it'll fl uh, flop around. What is the diagnosis in image B? So this is a normal patient, uh, well, sort of normal, non-obstructive. Um, and then what do, you, what do you see here? Okay, so Maggie thinks SBO. Anything, anyone else? Are we in consensus? Awesome. What is wrong with this image? So it's a chest radiograph, probably a portable. Heart is kind of big and the quality of the image is not great. Uh, and we see, we always start with lines and tubes, so you have to trick and then we have this catheter here, which looks similar to the, the other catheter. It's a pick line because you see it crossing along the subclavian. And so what is wrong with this image? Central line is in a duplicated SVC. We saw on the prior image that the central line should uh, be in the SVC. And here we see it crossing to the other side of the midline. So we think maybe it's central line in the aorta, okay? Uh, what does this indicate here? So this is a abdominal radiograph, frontal. And on, uh, so looks like the consensus is colitis, okay? Um, for bonus points, which segment of the bowel of the colon do you think is involved? Okay, transverse, everyone thinks transverse. What is this? So you can see certain things on radiographs. Uh, okay, so call it things gallstones. Okay, people think it's a consensus of gallstones. What is wrong with this image? This is a scanogram, which is an image we acquire right before we acquire the CT. So you look at the lines and tubes just like you would with a standard radiograph. So the guess. Any guesses as to what you think is wrong? B, pneumothorax. Call it things is maybe C, a malpositioned feeding tube. A pneumothorax, okay. Uh, where, which side is the abnormality in? Right side, left side, neither, left, okay. So, you know, with lines and tubes. So here we see um, this line tube here. Um, and then there's another catheter here. So this is uh, probably a this is a, probably a permacath because uh, it's dual lumen. There's a little linear line that crosses it, so it's dual lumen and coming down the subclavian into the right SVC, correct place. And then we see um, this line coming down up along the left. So we'll review that. Uh, here is a esophagram. So we this is the motility study. So the patient swallows, and then we get a cine image. Uh, what do you see here? 
esophageal structure, diverticulum mass reflux. So with an esophagram, you can assess structural as well as functional disorders. Uh, structural things like strictures, diverticulums, mass. Uh, functional, you can also assess like reflux, so you can assess for dysmotility. So everyone thinks is it's a stricture, okay? What is the diagnosis here? So it's another esophagram um, and we see this, the dilated esophagus. Okay, so Khaled is guessing A. Are we all in agreement? D. Someone else thinks it's, Kathy thinks it's D, maybe a stricture. Uh, so we see this standing column with contrast. Okay, so we'll review that. Is this catheter tube in proper position? Don't know. That's, so we'll learn. We'll, um, so what is this catheter or tube? A feeding tube or an NG tube? So we see two tubes here. One is here. It's a limited field of view, but you can see one there and then the other one crosses over and down south. What kind of tube is this? GJ? Okay, we'll review that. What is the diagnosis here? So this is a CT scan and it's with contrast because the vessels are bright and patient comes in with abdominal pain. So CT is helpful in these settings because you can see, diagnose the condition plus evaluate for any complications of it. So we think it's B, diverticulitis. Okay, we'll review that. Uh, this is a patient who is status pose MVC. What do you see in the red arrows? So here, and another foci is here. So this is another contrast enhanced CT, and we know that because the vessels are bright. And we think it's A, active extravasation. So this bright contrast here, that's outside the luminous contrast, okay? What is the diagnosis here? So this is a radiograph, and there's a lot of two, probably EKG lines over it, <clears throat> but no, nothing, no tubes internally. Um, any guesses? It's SBO, okay. And someone else thinks there's free air, okay. So we're, we're between free air and SBO. We'll review that. What's wrong with the colon? So this is the colon here, the air distended colon. And I want you to focus on the right colon. Pneumatosis. It'll be a large bowel obstruction or it's normal. The patient has a lot of catheters and tubes. Uh, it's a patient with a history of necrotizing pancreatitis from binging on alcohol after Coachella. Uh, any guesses as to what you think is going on in the colon or is it normal? C, we think it's normal, okay? Uh, and these, these, and these are just catheters that are draining the necrotic bed of the pancreas. It's a patient who presents history of Crohn's and presents with abdominal pain. And then this is the radiograph, KUB. KUB stands for kidney, ureter, bladder. What's wrong with this image? Normal, abnormal. Okay, so Kathy is, um, so Khaled thinks the colon is dilated and maybe from toxic megacolon is what Kathy raised. Good. So we'll talk about that. What study is this? Uh, this is the WAVE study, and then this is the, and then this is the results of that WAVE study. It's called an elastogram. What is this study called? Just recently, uh, there's a CPT that was issued, and uh, it's indicated in patients with diffuse liver disease to assess for what condition. Any guesses? Liver fibrosis, radiation effects, 
Okay, good. All right, where is the abnormality here? So this is a coronal CT and this is a upper GI floral study to evaluate the, typically the esophagus and the stomach. Any guesses as to where you think the abnormality is? We don't see this condition very much anymore. Okay, so we're thinking in the stomach, good. And where in the stomach? Greater or the lesser curvature? Or, any, or is it maybe the folds, the greater curvature? So here? Okay, any other guesses? So we think the, it might be here along the greater curvature of the stomach. Okay, so we'll get to that. What is the diagnosis here? Patient comes in with abdominal pain and we have a CT with IV contrast that we think is pancreatitis, okay. And what else do you see in the image? What's the most, what's, what are common causes of pancreatitis? Gallstones, good. So this could be gospel pancreatitis. And as we saw in the earlier case, another common cause of pancreatitis is alcohol. Um, so why do you need CT? You can diagnose pancreatitis by looking at lipase and amylase. Why do we get CT with IV contrast? Any guesses, thoughts? So CT, no, so if the patients don't improve in 72 hours. Um, necrosis, possible drain, good, yeah. So we do CT, at, CT of, for pancreatitis for the same reason we do it for diverticulitis, uh, appendicitis. It's, it's you know, diagnosis for sure, and then to look for complications of the, the condition. So pancreatitis, one of the complications is ne necrotizing pancreatitis. Uh, that's when you have devascularized, part of the pancreas become devascularized, so they're non-enhancing. And that's important because patients who have necrosis, uh, there's their chances of d death, um, I think increases like eightfold. And there's also compl other complications. You can get thrombus in the sp splenic vasculature from the inflammation. You can get fluid collections. Uh, all these findings, increases their chances of morbidity and mortality. And um, as Kathy mentioned, if there is a flu collection, for example, then you're going to be aggressive and try to either drain it, and if they're refractory, then debride it surgically. Um, what, okay, so great, so that's the end of the quiz. Uh, we're going to we'll talk about the technical aspects uh, and then we'll go through all the different kinds of studies. Um, so we'll start off first with radiograph and then we'll go into floral studies, fluoroscopic studies. So that include barium swallow, upper GI, small bowel follow through, um, when we use what. And then we'll review ultrasound, uh, pelvic ultrasound. So routine KUB is a plain radiograph and it's typically acquired with the patient in supine position. And we, this is sort of the bread and butter to look for lines and tubes, uh, to look for SBO ileus, uh, renal stones, uh, but it's just a screener. So it, you, if it's a negative KUB and you still have a high level of clinical suspicion, you shouldn't stop at a radiograph and you need something more. So here is a normal radiograph. When we look at radiograph, uh, so this is supine. Um, we're looking for, or the way I search for it. So I, you know, very similar search pattern. Uh, look for free air under the diaphragm. Uh, it's supine, so you're, it's going to be in the non-dependent portion. Um, you look for the shadows. So you have the liver shadow, the splenic shadow, the kidney shadows um, along the right paraspinous region. And then you look for gases. So you look at the bowel gas pattern. Stomach has a normal bubble of air. That's normal. Small bowel has a little bit of air, and colon has stool and air mixed together. So, uh, and then you look at the soft tissues and then the bones. Uh, so, KUB is sort of like your initial screening um, for bowel obstruction, free air, tubes, lines, uh, and when we typically do it before, uh, we call it an abdominal series, uh, upper chest series. So patients are upright or supine, and it's important because if you're concerned about SBO, what are you going to request? 
what position. Because you can use positioning to, exactly, yeah. So you're going to ask for an upright because you're going to look for air fluid level. And in the same way, if you're looking for free air, you can do the same thing because you're going to increase your chances of finding free air because it's very hard to see on supine unless you have a large volume free air. Uh, and if the patient cannot stand up, then you can ask for a lateral decubitus, so the liver side up, because you want to use the liver interface to try to bring out the free air. It's fast, uh, it's quick, uh, but it's limited in evaluation. So abdominal series is we do a KUB plus we do a chest x-ray. And this is sort of uh, looking for patients with acute abdomen, you know, if you're worried about obstruction, perforation, ileus. Radiograph depends on densities. There are five different densities. Air, which is loosened, because all the photons go through it. And then the highest density is metal. So patients who have implants, metal implants, for example, for hip replacement, it'll be very bright. And then you have the densities in between. So you have bone, soft tissue, fat. The positioning, uh, there's different positioning um, that we should be mindful of, which is similar in chest imaging. So it depends on the source of the radiation. So here, here's the radiation source. So it is anterior, posterior. So it's going through anterior, posterior. In contrast, this is PA, where you go from posterior to anterior. And then you can oblique the patients. Sometimes um, the radiation source will come from below. We typically see this with C-arm in the OR uh, or in the urology suite. Uh, Orthos, orthopods do this a lot um, during operations or procedures uh, to guide their um, needles and, and whatnot. Um, so you're right. So the positioning in A, I think everyone answered, uh, was AP because you're going from anterior to posterior. Uh, basics of radiographs, similar. You, you, know, you look for stones, bones, gases, masses, and foreign bodies. And uh, you go through a systematic approach like we do for a chest radiograph. So um, I look for free air. Um, so this is two radiographs uh, of a man and a woman. Uh, the, so I look for free air. I look for the shadow of the organs, make sure there's no hepatomegaly. Uh, sometimes it's the lack of normal structure. So you can have right here, you see the rectum with normal gas in the and stool and sometimes you no longer see that and that absence of normal structures can also clue you in to underlying abnormalities like masses um, so yes you look at the lung base um, because sometimes you can have pneumonia that can present with right upper quadrant pain so don't forget the lung bases uh, lung shadows gases and bones and the soft tissues uh, so there are normal fat that we see, and it can. You have to be careful because sometimes it can look like uh, free air. So, uh, for example, here we have normal per along the pericolic gut is just normal fat, and it's loosened like air. So, but knowing that that's the normal distribution of the air, no normal distribution of fat will help you to you know because you you expect that there. Um, in contrast, for example, in the right upper quadrant, the only structure that lives here is the liver. So if you see other things besides the liver, then you start to get worried. So here um, is a KUB. And um, well, I look at the lines and tubes first always. So what do we see here? What is this tube? Any guesses? Overlying the stomach. And G tube. Um, so where is the normal course of an NG tube? And G tube comes from above. So it, we typically see the course of the NG tube down the esophagus and into the stomach. So it is a tube, and it does remain in the stomach, um, but it's not per oral. It's a feeding tube. 
um, yeah, this, so this, we call, this is called a jet, um, G tube, gastrostomy tube. So it's a percutaneous placement of the tube and it's usually done for uh, suction um, or medication deliveries, things like that. Um, and sometimes feeding tube, uh, but in patients, uh, so the, the function can vary depending on the patient's condition. Um, but the thing to note here is um, this structure here, and you see that's displacing the normal rectum and then the gas. So as you all correctly stated, this is a distended bladder. Uh, the patient probably needs to go number one. Um, so other things you look for are the normal shadows of the solid organs. So we have, we said in the right upper quadrant, the only thing that should be there is the normal liver shadow. Here is the shadow of the kidney. Uh, sometimes you can see the shadow of the spleen. And then this triangular um, shadow here is the psoas muscle. Um, the, and then there's normal preperitoneal fat. And fat is lucent. Um, not as lucent as air, but lucent. So just be mindful that there's normal lucencies that are actually normal soft tissues. Um, basics of radiographs. So the other, once you get to that, you can then look for bones. Um, uh, so sometimes you can, the patient's going to have met. So, you know, putting bones in your normal search pattern is important to make sure we don't miss mets, uh, subacute fractures, things like that. Okay, so now let's get to the more interesting part, um, which is the bowel gas pattern. This is most commonly the reason for radiograph um, orders. So normal gas, uh, you can have small amount of gas in the small bowel, which is not fine. And then we have a mix of stool and air in the large colon. Um, the rules of three, so normal small bowel should be less than three centimeters, three millimeters in thickness. Uh, so three centimeters about the height of one vertebral body height. So here we see that it's normal, it's non-descended. Here on the other hand, um, what do you think here? Is this normal appearance of the small, small and large bowel gas pattern? So this patient also here has a, a catheter, probably a G-tube as well. Uh, so this is, um, it's not normal um, because we see a little bit more gas than we expect and in the, in the small bowel. So the small bowel should just have a little bit, not too much. Uh, but here we see it in the small bowel and um, sometimes, and then we also see it uh, throughout the colon. Uh, so uh, depending on the patient's condition, if they're post-op, then you think something like a dynamic alias uh, because you see air distended balance throughout small and large bowel. It's not asymmetrically um, enlarged. Free air. When we look for free air, the best position, as you stated, is to get an upright. And if patients cannot stand, then you can do a, a lateral decubitus, um, left lateral decubitus, so that the liver is up uh, in the non-dependent portion, because you need the liver uh, to create the um, overlap tissue so you can bring out the air. If you had the spleen side up, then the problem is there's small bile gas, so you, it would be very hard to differentiate free air. Uh, and if the patient cannot move, then you do a cross-table lateral. And I'll show you a picture of what cross-table lateral looks like. Uh, so here, as you correctly stated, there's free air under the diaphragm, and this is the best place to find it um, most sensitive place if the patient's able to stand up. Um, here is a cross table lateral. So the patient is on their back, supine, and then you emit the photon across, so right to left, and then the detector on the other side. Um, and what do you see here? Is this a normal cross table lateral radiograph? What's abnormal about it? There's free air. How do you know there's free air, Maggie? Outside of the bow wall. Yeah, so if you, you can look at the bow wall here, you should never see the bow wall that 
delineated. And the only time you see the wall that delineated is if you have air on either side of the bow wall. Uh, and that is called the regular sign. Um, so when you see bow wall outline like that, this is uh, a finding that we see with free air. And we see that here extending into the anterior abdominal wall. The patient had a colonoscopy, so they perfed the colon. Small bowel obstruction. Uh, so SBO, uh, you know, you can think about it like if you had a water, you know, a water pipe, and then you like kinked one side then upstream you're going to get dilatation and downstream you're going to get decompression and it's asymmetric so the upstream is going to be asymmetrically dilated and then downstream of the obstruction is going to be asymmetrically decompressed so those are what we're looking for um, here for so we see dilated small bowel sort of centered in the left abdomen and then sort of distally it's there's not much air here and then we see this fluid level in the stomach and in the small bowel. And um, so this is what SBO looks like. Once you have a diagnosis of SBO, you still need to proceed to a CT abdomen and pelvis. Why? What causes SBO? What are the three most common causes of SBOs? Good. A, adhesions, B for bulge, so hernias, C for cancer, right? So you need to figure out what's causing the SBO. Most commonly is adhesions just because most, you know, patients um, had prior operations, but it's important to diagnose it. If the patient's on a supine position, you're not going to see the air fluid level because uh, the air fluid level is sort of, you know, layering. Um, if the patient was supine and cannot move and you wanted to see the air fluid level, what can you do? How can you image the patient to see the air fluid level if the patient cannot move? Not that you need to in this case because the imaging findings um, are sufficient. But yes, you can do a cross table lateral or a lateral decubitus, um, but yeah, cross table lateral. Good. Um, so what's going on here? So we said in the frontal radiograph, you know, I look for free air. So I look under the diaphragm over the liver. Is that the normal appearance of the right upper quadrant? So in the right upper quadrant, the only thing that should live there is the soft tissue attenuation from the liver. Um, but here we see a different kind of attenuation. Uh, what's going on here? So there's this increased lucency, which is the same density as the air in the bowel. So this is free air in the right upper quadrant. Uh, and this patient is probably supine um, because we don't really see it layering under the diaphragm like we would expect. Um, the patient's bowel, there's also a little bit of gaseous distension, um, but this is hard. There's a little bit of bowel wall thickening. So small bowel obstruction, uh, we said, you know, ABC, adhesions, but bulges, and cancers. Uh, and so here's, and you can differentiate SBO from large bowel obstruction because SBO is typically central um, versus large bowel obstruction, which is usually sort of a, a picture frames. It's a lot along the edges following the path of the large bowel. And here we see the dilated bowel with uh, fluid levels. Um, large bowel obstruction, in contrast, uh, are usually along the, it's picture framing, right? So um, here we see diffusely distended large bowels, so transverse colon, descending colon, cecum. So uh, where would you put the obstruction in this image? Proximal or distal bowel? Proximal or distal, yeah. Um, because you see the entire length of the colon distended. And what is the most common cause of large bowel obstruction? What is the most common cause of large bowel obstruction by far? Rectal cancer. Colon cancer, yes, cancer. So if you see large bowel obstruction, 
then you uh, are going to be highly concerned about colorectal cancer. Uh, but there are other causes too. Uh, patients with diverticulitis um, can get inflammatory obstruction and then get a large bowel obstruction. So, um, but by far the most common cause is colon cancer. Um, the, you, bit, you know, in certain patient population, you, the patients can also get volvulus uh, and hernia. So one type of um, volvulus, it, so you can volvulize either the, typically either the sigmoid or the cecum because they're most floppy. Um, the transverse colon is uh, held by the transverse mesentery. Um, and the sigmoid mesentery is a little bit more floppy as is the cecum. So here, what we see is the colon is distended, and you see the transverse colon here, descending colon here, and then you see this twisty bean shape appearance. Um, so what kind, where do you think is involved? What segment of the colon? The sigmoid or the cecum? The sigmoid, yeah, because you see upstream dilatation, and that bean shape appearance is from the twisting. Um, so sigmoid volvulus typically happens in older people uh, on psych meds for unclear reasons, and uh, patients with sigmoid volvulus, um, it, they can actually be pneumatically decompressed endoscopically, so the gastroenterologist will go in with a scope from below and then they'll just um, insufflate it and then untwist it um, to relieve the obstruction. Um, this is in contrast to cecal volvulus, which is surgical. Uh, patients are at a high risk for ischemia. So, and cecal volvulus typically happens in patients who are young, are on chronic laxatives, things like that. So, a sequel volvulus has to be operated on in contrast to sigmoid volvulus, which can be managed endoscopically. A lot of things can cause um, obstruction. So another thing we think about is in the bowel wall thickening. Uh, bowel wall thickening is just a secondary sign of an, an underlying disease process. And that could be from infection. Uh, it could be from ischemia. It could be um, from... IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's or um, uh, UC. So um, here, here it is. So, uh, so it, we said uh, this was one of the quiz questions. So um, as everyone correctly stated, we have this thick in appearance of the transverse colon. And what is it? There's a sign that we um, have for this appearance. Does anyone know? Thumbprint sign, yeah. So it's as if someone put their thumb on this and then print, you know, then it has its appearance. So it, all it means is there's thickening of the colon. We don't know what the underlying cause is, um, but you know, that needs to be taken in the context of the patient's clinical history as well as um, imaging finding. Uh, so here is an example of um, diffusely um, so here, what's abnormal? Small bowel, large bowel, or both? Both, yeah. So you have um, balance air distension of small and large bowel. And this is what we see in patients who have a dynamic ileus, uh, patients who are on post-op, you know, on chronic opiates, and so there's decreased motility. Uh, so this is involving the small bowel. You can have a similar condition in the colon uh, called Olgavy syndrome, uh, where you have a dynamic colon. So it's not a structural obstruction, it's a functional obstruction. Um, the normal peristalsis is not working. And patients with Olgavy syndrome, uh, they get that because they're usually really sick um, really ill in the ICU, and so it's um, their their normal peristalsis are not working, but it can mimic large bowel obstruction. Uh, 
calcifications, those are other things that we can see both on radiograph and uh, CT. Um, so where are these calcifications? Any thoughts? Pancreas, and why do we see it? Why do, why do we see these calcifications in the pancreas? So what condition does the patient have? Chronic pancreatitis, yeah. So people with chronic pancreatitis will develop dystrophic calcifications, sometimes also in the pancreatic duct. Uh, and so that can cause complications uh, and recurrent pancreatitis. Uh, where are the calcifications here? On both sides here. What are these calcifications? Are these normal, abnormal? Diaphragm, okay. So we see it multiple sites here. So this is costal chondral cartilage. This is normal. Uh, it happens in older people. And the, the cartilage uh, that connects the rib to the sternum calcify. It's normal finding. What about these calcifications here in this patient? Is that normal, abnormal? Vessels, so ar arteries, um, not quite. So the iliac vessels cross and bifurcate like this. Uh, this is sort of going more along pelvic side wall, but along a vessel nevertheless. Um, so these are called flebolites. Uh, particularly they start calcification in the veins and it happens in normal people. Uh, what about these calcifications? Normal, abnormal. It's a woman. What are uterus? Good. And what's in the uterus that calcify like that? Fibroids. Good. So dystrophic calcification in uterine fibroids. And what are these calcifications here? Bilaterally, pretty heavy calcifications. Yep. Yeah. This, this is um, vascular disease, right? Vascular paths, severe atherosclerotic calcification of the vessels. And these calcifications, you guys all said earlier, gallstones. Good. All right, so let's talk about um, tubes uh, and other uh, things that you might see. So we have two types of enteric tube. Uh, one is called NG tube, and uh, the other one is a feeding tube, dom off tube. And NG tube, uh, the purpose is for suctioning. So patients who have obstruction, um, you know, ileus, whatnot, and they're not, you know, there's like nausea, nauseous or whatever. So that you can put a NG tube and there's a side holes on this. And the last side hole, there's a gap. So it's, this is the NG tube here. And the last side hole has a gap. So where, how do you know if an NG tube is in the right place? How do you tell by radiograph? What, what do you look for? Where should the side port be? That last hole in the NG tube. Any thoughts? Don't know? In the stomach? Okay, so let's say this, it's, um, the side port is here. This gap is here. Is that a good place? No, good, yeah. So the way you can tell NG tube is in the right place that the side hole has to be below the GE junction. So the GE junction is where the diaphragm and the vertebral body meets here. Uh, so here the side, pole is, side port is in the region of the fundus, so this is fine. Um, so if the side port is up above the G junction, then you need to advance it. So that's how you can tell if the NG tube is in the right place or not. Not necessarily where the tip is, but where the side port is, more importantly. This, in contrast, is a feeding tube. Uh, feeding tube, the way you tell the difference between a feeding tube from an NG tube is the tip. So the feeding tube has a weight at the tip here. It's, it's a little metal, and it helps the feeding tube sort of go a little deeper. Uh, into the small bowel. And it's also smaller in caliber uh, compared to an NG tube. Um, so where is the proper place for a feeding tube? 
So we said NG tubes should be living below the GE junction. But the feeding tube, in contrast, should be, okay, jejunum. So um, feeding tube, that's correct, but it can also be in the duodenum and still be in the proper place. Um, and the reason is because you want the feeding tube beyond the um, pylorus, uh, so in the duodenum. Uh, and that's because you have the pylorus, which serves, serves as a sphincter, so that you don't get reflux of food and tube feeds back, refluxing back into the stomach. So as long as it's beyond the uh, pylorus, you're good. And the only thing in the body that sort of makes a C-loop, you know, crosses the spine and then crosses the spine back is the duodenum. So that's how you know you're in the duodenum. It does this C-loop. What kind of tube is this here? NG tube, a feeding tube. Feeding tube, and is it in the right place? Yeah, so the feeding tube should be beyond the pylorus, and you see it starts to bend, and that bend is a duodenum. So it's it's fine, probably more optimally if it, you know, hopefully it'll advance a little bit more, but the tip of the feeding tube is here, so it's right at the junction. Good. Um, this was one of our quiz questions. So what tube do you see here? Feeding tube and G tube, and the second question is, is it in the right place? The feeding tube, and where is the feeding tube? Yes. This is why it's important to get a radiograph. It's in the left main bronchus. So this was actually a sentinel event um, at my where I trained. My patient had a feeding tube place. It was in the right main bronchus, and they started two feeds. It became a sentinel event. So you need to get a radiograph just to confirm tube placement because you can get severe complications. Uh, in the in the setting of malposition tube. Uh, what is the side port? So Chrissy was asking, what is, what is the side port of the NG tube? Can you tell where it is? Yeah. So the side port of the feeding tube is the last hole. So we in the NG tube, there's multiple holes because the, the function of an NG tube is just suction. So the last port is right here. It's um, where the gap is. So there's a radio opaque marker intentionally placed um, so we can see where the feeding tube is. And then that gap is the last hole. And can you tell? Yeah, you can tell where it is in most, most patients who have a good quality radiograph. Sometimes you can have, um, it's sometimes hard to tell because there's so much going on. Um, but if you have a good image, you can typically see where this gap is. Uh, this was a, one of our quiz questions. So this was a patient who came in with um, Crohn's and abdominal pain, and we see there's this thick walled dilated colon ascending and transverse. And this is the CT equivalent of it, which shows the same thing. So it's a patient with toxic megacolon. Um, toxic megacolon can happen from like in, it, infectious etiology as well, like C. diff. It can happen in Crohn's and it can lead to, um, if untreated, I can per perforate. Uh, so here was one of our quiz questions. Um, so here's a, a catheter, central venous catheter, and we said that was the pick. And it's going in, um, and I think most of you said it, it's in the aorta. Um, so definitely not in the right place. Uh, so you have to be careful. Um, so the you know, uh, look for the the color of the uh, blood that's coming back. You know, it shouldn't be bright red. It should not be pulsatile. Uh, if any of those things are evident, then you, you need to have a high level of suspicion for malposition catheter. Here, okay, so it's part a field of view is limited. Um, but we see an endotracheal tube, and endotracheal tube should be four to six centimeters above the crina. It shouldn't be too deep because then it can cause obstructions. For example, if it goes in the right main bronchus, then you can have collapse of the left main bronchus. However, if it's too proximal, then you can have the balloon that is right by the vocal cords, and so you can cause vocal cord disruption. 
or in worst cases, you could cause um, stenosis, scarring um, from infl inflammation of the trachea um, from poor and ET tube placement. So the other lines and tubes that are there is this line here uh, that goes down, across, over, and it comes this way. What is that line? Any thoughts as to what you think that is? Is it placed correctly? Um, that's a good question. Is it placed correctly? So which, what line typically follows that path? Is that a central line? It looks central line proximally, okay. Um, so it does have central access. So this is an um, IJ. So it's going through the IJ, coming down the IJ, and um, probably going to the atrium, right atrium, and then comes. So what? What is the outflow tract from the um, right ventricle? What vessel? Good. Yeah, pulmonary artery, right? Good. So it's a swan gans. It's this pulmonary artery catheter. So then you have it comes. The right outflow tract is the pulmonary artery, and then it crosses over to the right main pulmonary artery. And so the question was, is this in the correct place? Is it in the correct place? Any thoughts? No. Um, where is the normal position for a PA catheter? So we said a central line should be around this area. Endotracheal tube should be about 46 centimeters for the crina. We talked about the enteric tubes. Where should the main PA line? It should be near the left atrium. It should be two centimeters from the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery. So it should be within around this region in the mediastinum. And so they floated in and then they like typically retracted to get the pulmonary pressures. So this one is too deep. And <clears throat> what's happened as a result? So there's this triangular opacity here, and we saw it's an infarction, yeah. So this is an ihydrogenic equivalent of a Hampton's hump uh, from occlusion, not from a PE, but from a swan gans catheter um, malpositioned. Okay. Okay. Contrast. Okay, let's talk about contrast a little bit because um, you should know um, the types and how they're used and safety issues. Contrast is... Um, so while it can be water soluble or non water soluble, it's excreted by the kidneys. Um, excuse me, let me cough on some of this one. Um, so there's different kinds of contrast, uh, and the thickness of the contrast varies. It's like a Starbucks drink, you know, you can start off with just plain coffee, or you can get like a frappuccino and have a super thick, um, viscous. Uh, fluid drink. Um, so barium is probably the thickest. It's inert and it doesn't really cause any um, problems per se, but the problem is if the barium is left in the body, it never goes away. So this is why we don't give barium when we're concerned about esophageal perforation or bowel perforation, because if it leaks out into the peritoneum or in the mediastinum, then it's not going to go away. It's, you're going to have a permanent mediastinic cram. Um, so aspiration is harmless, but you can get, you know, a permanent bronchogram and patients have to drink a lot of water after they get barium, uh, because otherwise it, get, it, it can clump. Um, so that's oral agent. Um, so that's barium, but we also have, um, other oral agents, um, water soluble agents. So barium is not water soluble. It doesn't get absorbed by the peritoneum. So, but we can't, we do have water soluble agents such as gastrographin, um, which we can use if we're concerned about perforation. Vascular contrast. Um, so in contrast to barium, where patients drink it, uh, vascular, you give it intravenously or intraarterially. You know, if the patient's getting a coronary catheter or an angiogram uh, by the interventionalist. Uh, but for diagnostic imaging, so non-interventional, uh, vascular contrast we give through the vein intravenously. 
uh, and the newest agent, um, the newer agents, which is used by like 99% of the hospitals now are um, OmniPake, IsoView. These are non-ionic uh, and um, they are isoosmolar, uh, meaning they won't cause fluid shifts. And um, these newer agents are incredibly safe and there's almost absolutely like, uh, and getting a K AKI, acute kidney injury um, from these vascular agents is incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, so the New York guidelines that were released this year and last year from the American College of Radiology Contrast Media Committee says anyone with GFR greater than 30 can get IV contrast with, without any problems. And in fact, patients, not, not everyone needs creatinine or GFR measurement. Um, and for example, young people, healthy people don't need GFR um, or creatinine. They can just get CT with IV contrast without any creatinine uh, check. Um, and the only ones who need creatinine or GFR um, are people who have diabetes, who are greater than 60 years old, um, or have solitary kidney or history of kidney cancer. And so, you know, they're at an increased risk. But if they don't have those risk factors, then they can get um, CT with IV contrast. CT and gadolinium for MRI without um, having their GFR checked. And remember, we don't use creatinine when we decide we use GFR using the MDRG uh, equation, which accounts for gender, accounts for ethnicity, it accounts for BMI, uh, because those are important. And so GFR is a more accurate measure of renal function compared to creatinine. Uh, but yeah, as long as the GFR is greater than 30, they can get IV contrast without any issue. Uh, and remember, uh, and only like sort of those risk patients with risk factors need GFR. Non-vascular agents. So these are uh, contrasts that we give um, sometimes to the Foley catheter to check the renal collecting system. Uh, this is in contrast to the vascular agents we discussed and then the oral agents that we mentioned. The side effects of contrast. So this dose-dependent nephrotoxicity has been, this is more of a myth now. So there have been major studies, uh, hundreds of thousands of people from multiple centers showing that this idea of contrast-induced nephropathy is really, uh, it's, it's incorrect, it's wrong. And the reason is because it, contrast can cause re, uh, renal toxicity when with the agents that they've used in the past and when given arterially. So all these studies were done in patients who were getting coronary cath or angiogram, huge boluses, uh, hyperosmolar agents, ionic agents, um, but that's not the diagnostic population. Those, the, the diagnostic populations are getting intravenous, not intraarterial. These are isoosmolar and non-ionic. And so um, the it's, 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 it's really a hype, this AKI. So that's why the newer guidelines, um, the ACR guidelines say, as long as GFR is greater than 30, you can give contrast without any um, issue. And even patients who have GFR less than 30, um, you can uh, give it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's, it's sort of not really that big of a deal. Um, the, so th that's the, the, so now they have a new, more accurate condition, they call it post-contrast AKI, means the patients who are gonna get AKI will get it, uh, whether they get contrast or not, it's just because they're sick, you know, they're um, not doing well, so they, they develop AKI. So it just happens that they got the contrast as well. Uh, contrast reactions um, are different from nephrotoxicity. Contrast reaction is like a, a reaction, medication reaction. Uh, it's immune mediated and there's different severity, mild, moderate, and severe. So when patients have contrast reaction, you there's not really a major, we don't can't predict who's going to get it or who's not going to get it. Um, typically, patients just have a reaction. And if they have a reaction, then any subsequent CT that you do with IV contrast, the patient has to be premedicated with steroids and prednisone, so pr typically prednisone and Benadryl, um, uh, 13 um, and two hours before the the exam uh, because history of contrast reaction increases their chance of having a repeat reaction. So they need to get um, premedicated. Uh, there is an expedited 
pre-medication protocol that we have now uh, for patients who are in the ER. For example, you know, we need to get them turned around quickly. Um, and in those cases, you can give an IV version uh, at least four to five hours before the, the CT scan. But in some cases, you know, you're, the patient may, it's, you have to assess the risk and benefit, right? If the patient's going to die of an aortic rupture, you're not going to like, you're just going to give it. You're just going to give contrast, figure out what's going on with this patient. And if they have a reaction, then you'll like, you know, have the crash cart ready. So it, a lot of it depends on the clinical scenario. Uh, technical aspects. Okay, so let's go ahead and proceed. It's three o'clock. Do you, do you guys want to take a break? Or shall we keep going? Any thoughts? So technical aspects. Uh, so let's, we'll, we'll review um, esophagram. So esophagrams, we're looking at the esophagus. And we do this in patients who have dyspepsia. And you're thinking about, worried about reflux. Um, patients who have dysmotility, you know, um, a big gastric pain or chest pain that you think is from a GI source. And it can be done with um, we call it single or double contrast. Single, we just have them swallow barium. Double contrast, we coat the barium, we coat the mucosa, and then have them swallow equivalent of a um, like an alcohol seltzer. So it's just to distend it with air because air is another type of contrast agent. It's a negative contrast agent. Um, the strength, you can look at the functional data, functional information, as well as structural information. So... Uh, but the problem is it's operator dependent and you, you have sort of a limited evaluation. Here is how an esophagram is performed. Uh, patients come into the radiology. This is an outpatient study. Uh, it can be done inpatient as well. Um, but you get the, get the radiograph, or you, this is a floral machine. Um, and then once um, you get that, then you ask them to um, swallow... Um, this we call it effervescent crystals. It's it's like alkyl seltzer, and then you follow that up with barium. So that gives it two different types of contrast: air and barium. And then you can then um, follow that swallow as the patient as the peristalsis move forward, and then assess it. Um, so then you get these images. Um, so you can look at the structural as well as the functional information. Then you have the patient. Um, in a RAO position and do the same thing. You have them swallow um, one gulp of um, contrast at a time. And this one assesses the functional parameters. And the reason you do it, it in a supine or RAO position is because if you have the patient standing up, the gravity pulls it down. So you don't know if it's actually from paracelsis or from gravity. So putting them in that RAO position removes gravity as a factor. And then when you're done with that, you can um, have them supine and have them lift their leg uh, and try to induce reflux and see if they have reflux or not. Um, so that's how we do an uh, esophagram. So here is a motility part of the exam. So you see here, there's a little hiatal hernia. So part of the stomach is going up into the thoracic cavity. But overall, the primary and this, you're looking for the primary and secondary peristalsis, right? So patient drinks a bolus of contrast and you see the primary and then you have a wave of secondary contractions that clears the contrast. So that's normal functional um, function of the esophagus. In contrast, though, here, same thing, but what do you think here? Is this normal primary and secondary contractions? Abnormal. What's abnormal about it? So they call this a corkscrew pattern. Uh, if you look at the, you have a lot of tertiary contractions right there that are non-propulsive, right? They're not moving the bolus forward. And it um, so we, this is a, we call it dysmotility. Uh, so the, the, mo, the, mo, the paracelsis is not normal. So it's dysmodal and there's different severity of it. And patient can, patients can have severe dysphagia. They can have dyspepsia um, from dysmotility. Okay. So th that's a example of a functional disorder that we can evaluate by esophagram. Here is uh, the quiz question, and this is not functional, this is a structural 
problem. Here, what you see is in the distal esophagus, there's this fixed stricture. And the reason you know it's fixed is because, you know, the normal esophagus, it should contract and then open, right? So it should open. Of course, you have contraction. But here, it never opens up. Um, so that's a distal stricture. So um, what is the most common cause of distal strictures? What causes strictures in that location? Any thoughts? Cancer? Okay, yeah. So the most common cause of strictures in that location is reflux. So they get chronic reflux that causes irritation. So then there's just esophagus strictures now. What about, what about Barrett's? Where do patients with Barrett's esophagus get stricture? So we saw this was in the distal esophagus. Where do people with Barrett's get strictures? Distal? Mm, people with Barrett's get strictures in the mid esophagus. Um, the reason is because with Barrett's, you get that metaplasia, you know, so the normal esophageal epithelium is like sort of transformed. Um, and so, so what happens is that part, that distal segment is like abnormal metaplasia. So then the normal part of the esophagus sort of becomes more proximal. And so that's where it structures now. So patients with mid esophageal strictures, you're gonna worry about Barrett's. So the patient will need to get scoped. Um, so yes, this is correct. This was um, stricture, a high grade stricture distally. So. Uh, patients will then need uh, an esophageal plasty, balloon dilatation, okay? So in, um, another structural thing that we can find is diverticulum. So here we see this little diverticulum that's pooching out here uh, in the mid-esophagus. That's just kind of hanging out there. Um, you can look for um, masses as well. You can have extrinsic pressure. Here we have uh, cervical esophagus and so what do you see here? Is this a normal appearance during swallow? No. What's abnormal about it? What lives anterior to the esophagus? Zankers? Um, where is a zankers? Where is the zankers? Anterior or posterior esophagus? Posterior, okay? So is this anterior or posterior? Anterior. So what lives in the anterior? What structure lives in the anterior? Anterior to the esophagus. Trachea. So where is this contrast going? In the trachea, the patient's aspirating. So this is what aspiration looks like. They're, um, they don't have, um, you know, and it could be silent aspiration or it could be symptomatic, um, you know, that you, have to assess at the time of the uh, esophagram or the swallow study. If there's a concern for esophageal perforation, what contrast should you use? If there's a concern for esophageal perforation, gastrographin, good, um, or omnipake, right? So if you're worried about a perforation, you don't want to do barium because if there's a large perforation, it goes in the mediastinum, you can cause mediastinitis. So you start with gastrographin, which is water soluble. So is omnipac. Omnipac is also gastro, um, is also water soluble. But the difference between gastro and omni is gastro has more more iodine, so you're more likely to pick up a leak if there's a leak. Omnipac has less iodine, so it's like the latte version, and gastrographin is like the frappuccino version. Um, so you just have more iodine. So. Um, but the most sensitive contrast is barium because it has the highest um, iodine concentration. So sometimes what we can do is if you're really worried about like a small leak and the gastrographin is negative, then you can follow that with the barium, a cereal, uh, to pick up the small leaks that you could otherwise miss on a gastrographin study. Okay, so here is, um, what do you think here? So there is this sac-like structure. Um, what do you think? And it is posterior. Good. So that's a Zenger's diverticulum. Zenger's diverticulum. Um, what else do we see? Is that all? Where should the con aspiration? Yeah. So the patient is aspirating as well. 
um, and you see that contrast leaking anteriorly down the vocal cords and into the trachea. Um, so that's the Zenger side reticulum, um, and you know it can become symptomatic. Patients can have halitosis, you know, depending on the severity and the size of it. Okay, um, and that we can diagnose on upper GI or esophagram. Here is an example of a long segment stricture. So this is normal esophagus that's open, and here it's a fixed. This is not a dynamic, so it's I, you only have one image, but. Um, you see this long stricture, and so you can get that in people with prolonged NG tube. This is why you shouldn't give NG tube unless you need it, because you can cause strictures. Uh, patients who ingest lye um, to commit suicide, uh, radiation therapy, uh, anything like that, can cause long segment strictures. Okay, now we're going to move on to upper GI. So that was esophagram. The difference between an upper GI and an esophagram is that upper GI, we also check out the stomach. So we do the esophagram as well, but then we also um, uh, evaluate the stomach. Okay, so um, you can do this uh, when you're worried about um, people with like vomiting, you have, maybe you're concerned about ulcers or polyps, malabsorptions. Um, but I mean, if you're going to start evaluating stomach, small bowel, um, like um, you can start off with an upper GI, but the better study, if you're going to look for like bowel disease, is an MR enterography in, in a non-acute setting. Um, but it's a good start. So here you have an upper GI. It's a patient who status pose uh, Nissen, Nissen fundal plication. Uh, so this is the wrap around the, uh, the G junction uh, with the stomach wrapped around. And then we have this contrast. What is this? Is that normal location for contrast? Normal, let him, let the patient go. Any thoughts? Perforation, good. So the patient has a, a leak. Um, so maybe the anastomosis is not sealed. Um, you know, it's hard to say for sure, but there's um, contrast leak. So that's what we do. Uh, so in that case, what contrast would you use? Barium. Gastro, omni, good. Yeah, so you can um, do either gastro or omni. Um, I would, if, if you know it's, um, yeah, if the patient is, if you're concerned about aspiration, you can do omni. Uh, the reason is because patients who are aspirators, if you, if the patients aspirate gastrographin, it causes pneumonitis. Um, gastrographin is hyperosmolar, causes fluid shifts, and so then they get pneumonitis, which can be problematic. Um, so you want to give uh, omnipake, which is inert. It doesn't cause any reaction. Um, but remember, omnipake has less iodine, so you're less likely to pick up perf um, and leaks if there's a small one. Here is another patient with an esophagram. So you have this standing column of contrast, and then it tapers into this beak-like appearance. Um, so what is this? Echalasia. So echalasia uh, is, there's two types, primary and secondary. Um, but the basically the underlying problem is the myenteric plexus, the nerves um, that regulate the lower esophageal sphincter it's not working. So it's just constantly in a high contraction state. Uh, so primary is idiopathic. We don't know why it's you know not working well. Secondary can be from Chagas, um, a host of causes. Uh, and the treatment for this is to basically do a, a myotomy. So they cut the sphincter uh, to just relax it because it's too tight. Uh, so that was the answer. Um, here, this is a, this is hard, but um, with upper GI you can't see it. So this is the stomach. This is the rugal folds of the stomach, and here's the C loop of the duodenum. Um, and here, there's this um, extra sort of contrast adjacent. So what is this? So you should the lumen of the duodenum should be nice and you know, fine. But here we see this contrast that's sort of like going out. Um, so this is uh, from an ulcer crater. 
So there's the, a creator from there and that's causing the, call it, causing the contrast to pool there. So we don't see this very much anymore because of protonics, uh, but sometimes patients can have it. So here uh, is an upper GI. So you, we see the stomach nice and well distended. What do you see here? Is that normal, abnormal? And if it's abnormal, where is the abnormality? This is one of our quiz questions. It's a moth eaten like. Um, so what we see here is on the upper GI, there's this contrast pulling here along the lesser curvature. And if you look at the CT scan, it corresponds to this, um, we call it giant ulcer. Um, and there's stranding around it. So this is a giant peptic ulcer. Moth eaten is a description we use for permeative bone disease. So we typically um, use that word like moth eaten, eaten um, for an aggressive destructive process that involves bones. Uh, for GI, uh, we say there's um, this crater that fills with contrast and that is consistent with an ulcer. Uh, and it's, it's a giant ulcer because um, it's large. Is there anything wrong with a small bowel? Um, there's a little bit of air, but maybe a little bit ileus, um, but no obstruction. There's air through all throughout the rect, uh, all throughout the colon and small bowel. The bowel wall looks thin; it's not thickened. Um, there's no nodularity. The caliper looks uh, non-obstructive. Um, did you? Um, did you? What did you think? It um, is going on with the bowel. Oh, if there is um, free air. Okay, so uh, this is soft tissue window. So uh, the best window to look at for free air is uh, actually lung windows. Um, but here, um, the air that I, I do see in the field of view is uh, intraluminal. Um, so, but that's a good point. Um, if you did have an ulcer, um, like in the proximal duodenum, then uh, where would you expect the free air to be? Let's say we that ulcer here, right? We have a proximal duodenum here, and let's say this one perforated. Where would the free air go? So the first portion of the duodenum is in the retroperitoneum. So if the ulcer perf, then the free air would be in the retroperitoneal space. Um, so it would be very hard to see on a radiograph uh, because it wouldn't go under the, it's not in the peritoneum, so it wouldn't be subdiaphragmatic as we typically expect if it's um, peritoneal. Um, okay, so what what is this tube here? Feeding tube, and is it in the right place? Good, yeah, it's in the right place, right? It's probably in the third, fourth portion of the duodenum. All right, let's talk about small bowel follow through. The small bowel follow through looks at small bowel. Uh, we can assess um, bowel wall thickening, fold pattern, caliber. And nowadays, we only do small bowel follow through uh, for the surgeons who are, you know, either wanting to know where the obstruction is or more commonly to try to get the patient to um, open up. So we can give gastrographin. Gastrographin is like hyperosmolar, so that it causes, it causes irritation and causes um, bowel peristalsis. So patients who have obstruction, they'll give it to, you know, try to promote it um, to sort of ex expedite the recovery. Uh, so that's usually just sort of now why we do it. Um, because if you are worried about a small bowel condition, in an outpatient setting, you should get an MR interrography. MR is much better, uh, more sensitive, and that's what is recommended, not small bowel follow through. Small bowel wall is like sort of the stone age now. Um, you want to get an MR enterography. If the patient is acutely sick and ill and coming to the ER and you're worried about a small bowel condition, say a patient has a history of Crohn's, then you can get a CT because CT is faster. Uh, but it's the same thing. You In CT or MR enterography, they drink a bunch of contrast like they do here. But instead of doing a radiograph, you do a CT scan or an MR, MRI. Um, so CTs are usually reserved for patients who are acutely sick. Anyone who is not sick and you just sort of work up on an outpatient basis should get an MR. 
Um, okay, now we're going to talk about from below. So um, this is an enema from below. So we put a catheter in the rectum and then inject contrast. And so you, now you can look at the colon. Um, we now do this for different reasons, like for typically for surgical planning. This is more commonly done in pediatric patients when they're worried about atresia, Hirschsprung, things like that. Um, in the adult setting, it's for like patients who've had Hartman's procedure and now the surgeon wants to know how much length they have left. Uh, this used to be uh, the screening tool for colon cancer, uh, but now we have CT colonoscopy, which is endorsed by the U.S. Preventive Task Force for colon cancer screening. So we only really do barium enemas in sort of like the county setting where they might not have CT colonography or, you know, they're, they're like too backed up on to for colonoscopy, so they'll get a bare minima to for colon cancer screening. Okay, now, um, so you can like inject contrast in every orifice, and here we're doing it in the GU system, urinary system. So here we put contrast in the um, bladder, and then, uh, so this is called cystogram, because you're looking at the bladder. You can do a voiding cystic urethrogram um, to look for structural problems. Uh, so if the patients, if you're worried about diverticulum, um, bladder rupture, then you can do a cystogram. And all these studies, well, not all, but cystogram, um, um, like the small bowel follicle, those things you can do a CT equivalent. So you can give a cystogram and do a CT. And with a CT, you can get cross-sectional anatomy as well, in addition to what we see here. Uh, this is a retrograde urethrogram, so we're going working our way down. So now we're looking at the urethra. So they inject contrast, put a little catheter here, and then inject contrast to assess the urethra. And you can do that in the setting of trauma if you're worried about strictures, things like that. Okay, so um, we're going to talk now about cross-sectional imaging. We spent time on the radiograph. Now we're going to do CT, ultrasound, and MR as it applies to abdomen and pelvis. So CT scan is, um, this is how it works. So patients go into this gantry and then there's, um, this was well, an old version of a CT scanner, but uh, basically you have a radiation tube and then it just spins around the patient um, really fast. And then it acquires uh, tons and tons of images, uh, which gets reconstructed and then gives the images that we have been looking at, okay? And now they have this thing called dual energy CT. So you, don't, you have not one, but two radiation source, and then, um, but they're at different energies. So you get, you can look, you can look for um, tissue characteristics, like dual energy CT is really good for gout, for example. Uh, so the American Rheumatology Association, if you're concerned about a patient with gout, uh, you can get a dual energy CT to diagnose gout. Um, routine CT scan. So whenever possible, you want to give IV contrast um, because contrast, it's like turning on the light in the room. You could just see everything much better. Um, the only time you wouldn't give contrast is first if the patient has um, GFR less than 30, then you have to do it case by case basis. Uh, or if you're looking for renal stones. Renal stones, you don't need contrast. Uh, but if a patient comes in with flank pain, it's the first time they have no history of renal stones, you should still do it with IV contrast because a lot of things can cause flank pain. Uh, pyelonephritis, you can have um, diverticulitis, you can have a lot of causes. So for initial evaluation, um, do with IV contrast. When do you use oral? Um, so oral contrast, uh, we like it. Um, and because you can see more, but the problem is patients who get oral contrast, they have to wait two hours because that's how long it takes for the oral contrast to make it to the terminal ileum. So in the ER setting, uh, we don't give oral anymore because we want to get the patient in and out. Um, so, but in a non-emergent setting, then oral contrast is helpful. Uh, but this is like a routine study. You can do specialized studies uh, where you're looking for specific things. So we do specialized studies very commonly in oncologic setting. Uh, for If you're worried about liver cancer or pancreatic cancer, then we do specific protocols for different kinds of cancers. And as we mentioned earlier, if you worry about a small bowel, we can do a special protocol for enterography looking at. It's tailored to optimize the small bowel. 
Uh, so overriding principle, tailor the exam to answer the question. So if it's you know not your typical abdominal pain and you have a very specific question and you don't know what to order, then just talk to the radiologist or look up American College of Radiology appropriateness criteria and then it'll tell you what to order. And if the patients have contrast allergy, then they need to do an oral prep. So 12 hours and two hours before uh, they get the contrast. I, but now ACR also endorses, uh, they call it expedited allergy contrast. So you get it at least four to five hours before and it's IV, not oral. And that's um, found to be as, as effective and typically done in the ER setting, for example, where you want to get the patients in and out. Okay, so a lot of different things that you can diagnose by CT with IV contrast, and here are some of them. Um, here is an example of a patient with so CT abdomen and pelvis. Um, and what do you see? Normal CT abdomen and pelvis? Abnormal? So you have this like abnormal, yeah. So he has dilated, and then there's this, what is this high density structure in this dilated tubular bowel? Yeah, it's an intercolith, right? So it's a, a stool ball that's sort of calcified. And so that's causing obstruction at the appendiceal base, causing the appendix to become dilated, thick balled. And then you get this stranding around the mesentery uh, from the inflammation. So patients who have, um, so this patient looks, you know, obviously appendicitis. <clears throat> so it's important to mention these, know these things, because sometimes, um, apparently, like some patients who have sort of uncomplicated appendicitis that don't have an obstruction can get IV antibiotics and do fine. So if it's a mechanical obstruction, then IV antibiotics is not going to suffice. Here is um, a patient with a routine CT abdomen and pelvis, a uh, coronal image. Um, so we can review some anatomy here. Um, so what is the structure here? Comes off the aorta. Here, maybe I'll show it. What is this vessel here? Celiac, it's going down into the mesentery. So the celiac is up here, this one. There, okay, good, so SMA, good. And then what is the structure here? This triangular structure. that sits on the kidneys. Good. Um, and what, um, how many different mesenteries are there? So two, three, four. So you have the small ball mesentery, you have the transverse mesentery, and then you have the sigmoid mesentery. So those are the, those are the three mesenteries. Okay. Um, what is, um, so you see with contrast, um, you can see these structures just a lot more clearly, the vasculatures and the solid organs. So contrast really uh, improves the visualization and characterization. Here, this patient does not have oral contrast, but there's fluid in it. So the fluid sort of acts as a contrast as well. And sometimes for when we do enterography, we'll give a negative contrast agent. So we'll give, have the patient drink uh, the lumen, which is a negative contrast. So that's in contrast to a positive contrast where it's brighter and negative contrast, contrast makes it darker. And this is, this is helpful because you can look at the bow wall really well here. So you can look for nodularity, thickness, uh, whatnot. And that would be obscured if it was positive contrast. Uh, here is a patient with um, a, a appendicitis that we saw, but now we have a fluid collection. So at what time point, um, do you need to drain a fluid collection? Say the patient has an abscess. When, do, when are you going to ask IR to drain the abscess? What's sort of like the rule of thumb for when uh, abscess will not respond to IV antibiotics? Timing, um, it's, well, there's a size cutoff and it's usually three centimeters. So if the patient has a fluid collection that's about three centimeters, then it's unlikely to um, resolve on its own and you'll need a fluid uh, drainage. So um, CT can help you with that. Um, here, but remember like a lot of patients, um, you can have different causes. So you have to keep an open mind 
uh, and sort of search carefully. So here we have the diagnosis that we have before, which is you know this appendix. So normal appendix is thin walled. It has air in it. That's normal. Um, abnormal appendix, um, as we saw earlier, you get dilated and thick walled. Um, but there are a lot of um, different causes. So here you have a complicated appendicitis that has perforated. Uh, this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, so once it's perforated, it's sort of not operative now. They just get drainage uh, and then, you know, hopefully it'll get better. But here's a condition that can also present with right lower quadrant pain. It's not appendicitis. Instead, what you see is this fat and it's there's stranding around it. So this is called epiploic appendicitis. When does it count as a phlegmon? A phlegmon is an inflammatory mass without a wall. So a we call it a phlegmon when it, um, it, it hasn't organized itself yet. So a phlegmon, in contrast to an abscess, is non-drainable because it's just inflammation. And then over time, it'll organize uh, and it'll have a nice wall around it. And then that's when we can drain it. Um, so here um, is oh yeah, fat and there's stranding around it. So this is an epiploic appendicitis. Um, so if the patient has epiploic appendicitis, what do you do? Well, take them to the OR, send them out with NSAIDs, give them IV antibiotics. Any guesses? Ask an attending. <laughs> That's great. Um, so epiploic appendicitis is the twisting of the, the little fat tags that are along the hostra. <clears throat> so they can twist and infarct. And so that's what an epiploic appendicitis is. And these, in contrast, appendicitis are treated with ibuprofen. So patients get ibuprofen and then they get sent home because it's just conservative therapy. Okay. Um, diverticulitis, we said um, earlier. So you have um, patients with diverticuli, uh, these little outpouchings, and then those things can get inflamed and then cause diverticulitis. And CT can help look for fluid collections, complications like fistulas and things like that. Uh, but remember, if a patient has diverticulitis, it can easily mask a colon cancer. So if they are greater than 45 years old, they need to get their colon cancer screening because a diverticulitis can mask an underlying colon cancer. Uh, so that's diverticulitis. Um, this one we s spoke about earlier. This is a gastric peptic ulcer disease. Um, a lot of different causes. Um, H. pylori, but now we have protonics and stuff like that, so we don't really see it very much anymore uh, because of that. Uh, here, everyone said it. You have uh, vascular injury, so you have little, these little puddles of contrast. So how do you treat this? So here we have a splenic uh, active extravasation. Here we have common femoral. How do you treat this? Redline them to the OR. Interventional radiology with coil embolization or just watch and wait. Any guesses? Coil sounds awesome. Yes. So these cases used to be taken to the OR in the past, but now they do embolization. So patients uh, get a, you know, the interventional radiologist will put a catheter up the common femoral artery and then select out the celiac axis and then just put little coils there to block off the vessel. They can do a super selective embolization. So they won't block off the splenic artery. They'll go even further, deeper into the segment and then block off the, the segmental artery to preserve the splenic uh, function in the remainder of the normal spleen. Um, similarly here, depending on what is embolized, if the internal iliac is extravasated, they could just embolize the internal iliac artery without any sequelae because there's collateral flow. Um, and Or here, for example, if they have uh, a rupture of the common iliac or common femoral, they could put a stent across it to bypass the injury. Okay. Uh, sequel volvulus. Oh, so here is another CT abdomen, acute abdomen. So here we see this twisting or whirling pattern that we see typically with 
uh, volvulus here. It just happens to be a sequel volvulus, but you can volvulize small bowel, you can volvulize different things. Um, here's a sigmoid volvulus. Uh, remember, sigmoid is distal, so we see the entire colon distended. And here is a rectal contrast. They used to treat this with enemas, but now they do it with endoscope. So but anyway, so with the enema, you see this uh, beak appearance where the twisting is. Here is a um, CT abdomen and pelvis, and we see air and this thick rim with sort of st stuff in it. Uh, and there's multiple actually fluid collections. Um, there's another similar appearance in the left pelvic sidewall. So this is an abscess because you have a nice rim around it, hypodense, like viscous pus or whatever is in there that you can then uh, access. Here, this one you can probably do transgluteal. Here you can do a transhepatic and then drain these abscesses. Um, here is a periapendiceal abscess. Um, so this is a phlegmon. So here you have just an inflammatory process. Uh, but then if you go down, you see it starts to get hypodense. So this is where you have that um, more of a fluid component. Uh, so, and it's starting to get a little walled off. So eventually it'll all get walled off and then it'll all sort of like become fluidy and that can be drained. Um, but if we see only just this part, inflammatory process, you can't drain it because there's no organized fluid to drain. Um, here we see, um, this is bowel, here with bowel. So, um, is that a normal looking bowel? Abnormal. So this is, normal bowel is three millimeters in thickness. Um, so this is, yeah, there's like, it's thickened, right? And uh, what else do you notice about it? Well, look at the mucosa. Right, so what do you think about the mucosa? Is it hyperemic, hyporemic, isoremic? It's the same density as aorta. So it's hyperemic. So it's a hyper, hyperemic wall. Hyper, there's a very high vascularity. So when you see this stuff, you have to sort of get scared because then you can have ischemia, uh, bowel, bowel ischemia. So they get um, permeability into the mucosa. Um, so, uh, or sometimes you have like in end stages, like complete non-enhancement. Um, then, then, you know, then you start worrying about non-enhancement and necrosis. Uh, so these are all sort of bad CT signs. And the patient also has ascites, which is also another bad sign. This patient probably has a compromise, if not at risk bowel for infarction. And that could be due, for, due to a lot of things, uh, vascular, so if they can have a, an, a thrombus, an emboli into, um, you know, SMA, or uh, they can get hypoperfusion, you know, if they were septic. Um, it could be from uh, in some cases, like, you know, raging infection. Um, it can be from hernias where they have an obstruction, like a closed loop bowel obstruction. So there's different causes that you got to figure out what that, what, why the patient has those findings. Um, here we see a, a radiograph and what see this sort of asymmetric dilated small bowel. Um, and then here we see de decompression uh, with proximal dilatation. So those are consistent with... Um, obstruction. Uh, and we saw this case already and everyone answered correctly. That's a properly placed feeding tube. Uh, here's a patient with a liver mass. So um, HCC. So uh, remember we said we can do specialized exam for a different indication. And one of the indications is for um, HCC. Um, we have, you know, NAFLD, Hep C, Hep B, a lot of different diffuse liver disease is very common. Um, Currently, HCC is a leading indication for a liver transplant, but it's going to be surpassed by NAFLD soon, uh, NASH, because of the epidemic. And so liver cancer are enhancing. Um, so they're very vascular. There's a lot of neoangiogenesis. So you get sort of this asymmetric hyperenhancement of the mass compared to the background liver. And you see the liver here is very undulating. So when do we see that?
So we see this undulating appearance in fi yeah fibrosis and specifically which stage fibrosis. So fibrosis, there's four stages. Yes, cirrhosis. So stage four uh, fibrosis is also known as cirrhosis. So we see this. So this patient has underlying cirrhosis. Of course, cirrhosis we know is a risk factor for HDC. So patients have this appearance, right? So now um, it's we said it's five centimeters. So what do you do? What can you do for the patient for five centimeters, liver mass? Just leave it be. I'll give them medications, take them to the surgery. Okay, so Josh thinks we should resect it. Any other thoughts? You can do a segmentectomy, okay. Surgery, so another vote for surgery. Medical management, okay. Okay, so um, well, since we're talking radiology, we're gonna uh, talk. So this is, um, they use the Barcelona criteria. Um, there's a modified one called the UCSF criteria. The mainstay treatment for HCC is what? How do you cure HCC? Transplant, yeah. So patients um, are, you should get transplant, and sometimes so how right you have shortage of liver, so um, the supply demand, so you're gonna have more livers that you need, you know, compared to the supply. So patients have to be bridged to liver transplant. So we use the Milan criteria to determine if the patient qualifies. So Milan criteria says maximum of three centimeters, um, up to three masses. Here, this patient has a five centimeter mass, so the patient has exceeded uh, the Milan criteria. So they're no longer a transplant candidate because they exceed the Milan criteria. So what we can do is um, we can actually downstage them um, to meet Milan criteria. And you can do that through um, uh, TACE, trans arterial chemoembolization. And this is what the guidelines say we should do. Um, so with trans TACE, uh, this is um, interventional radiology. So they've selected out the, what is this vessel here? It's going to the mesentery, and then you've got blood that comes back up into the liver. Okay, I'll show you again. Which vessel have they selected out? Um, portal, okay, any other guesses? So you've got the vessels, so, so here's the right colic, here's the middle colic, here's the jejunal branches, okay? So what do you think? Celiac, okay, any other gases? So what are the three structures that arise from the celiac? So you have the common hepatic, splenic, and left gastric, right? So here, do you see any of those three structures? So you got this vessel, here's the mesentery, you've got the right colic, ileal colic, Middle colic. So, what is this vessel? If I showed you this on the CT scan, you guys would get it. This is a slightly different way to visualize this vessel. So, this is the SMA. Oh, sorry, Kathy said it already. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't see that. I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah. So, it's an SMA. So, they do that because they want to assess for the portal vein patency. So, you wait, 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 and then. Um, it's pretty fast. And now you use the portal vein, see? So you see the SMV and then it goes up into the portal vein right there. So they do this run just to make sure the portal vein is patent and there's not a tumor in it because if there's a tumor in it, then they can no longer do taste, trans arterial chemoembolization. So now they show that the portal vein is patent. So now we've selected out what structure now? So we've gone more cranial and we've selected out, now what is this vessel? Celiac, good. So celiac, so this is a common hepatic, right? This is, what is this branch here? What's the first branch of the common, common hepatic? Ah, uh, gastroduodenal, good, yeah. So here's GDA, and then they keep going, and so now there's this mass, right, that correspond to our CT findings. And then now they're going to embolize it. So um, embolize, so these little tiny beads, um, what they do is they inject that, they super select it, right? So they find the vessel that feeds the HCC. So HCC is fed by 
the arterial system. Uh, this is in contrast to the liver, which is fed by what system? The liver is fed by the portal system. Good. 70% of the liver comes from the portal system. In contrast, HCC comes 100% from the arterial system. So they super select out the vessel, and then they put a bunch of beads into this thing. They pack it with beads, so they basically cause an obstruction. And now, after the embolization, we do an injection, and look, it's all, there's no more vascularity, right? They've completely occluded the supply to the HTC. So that's what it is. So HTC. And so we use this um, criteria called LIRATS. It's um, a one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, basically, um, if a patient, it tells you this, like how suspicious you are. So LIRADS 1 is normal, 2 is normal, 3 we don't know, 4 probably um, cancer, they need to be watched, 5 definitely cancer. So um, that has to do with a combination of imaging findings, arterial enhancement, venous washout, uh, capsule. And so if it's this is kind of unique because HTC is the one cancer where you don't need a biopsy for the patient to get a liver transplant. You can call a, a lesion Lyrats 5, you know, if it meets the Milan criteria, so less than three centimeters, three masses, less than, um, um, then they can automatically go directly to transplant without getting a biopsy. So this is why Lyrats is really important because it's the one cancer where you don't need tissue diagnosis if you have a Lyrats 5 lesion. Uh, but anyways, so it's a combination of size. Of course, the larger it is, the more likely it's going to be cancer. The smaller it is, the less, you know, you're going to sort of go more threes and fours. But this is only for patients with diffuse liver disease, with hepatitis, you know, we said NAPL, NASH, whatnot. Um, not for kids, not for like non-diffuse uh, liver disease. So patients with bug chiari or like congenital atresias, whatever, we don't, it's not for that, Okay. Um, so the American College of Radiology says if the patient has liver disease, screening and surveillance should be done with MR. We know we use ultrasound for sure, but um, I think ultrasound or MR, but MR is a lot more sensitive and specific uh, compared to ultrasound um, because you can miss a lot on ultrasound. So uh, this is what the recommendation is. So in small tumors, uh, we can... Oh no. Oh my God, are you kidding me? No way. Um, we can do this thing called um, ablation. Okay, I have to show you guys this because this is becoming, is the thing now. Um, oh, I can't believe they like removed it. Okay, so um, radio frequency ablation of the tumor is where they put a needle into the tumor. Um, um, they put a needle into the tumor. Here, maybe this one's better. I'm sorry, the other one was great, and I'm so sad that they got discontinued. Um, oh man. They put a needle into the tumor and they burn it, and it's done under CT guidance, CT and ultrasound guidance. Uh, so they, here, here's an example. So they put the needle into the tumor and they just burn, 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 burn the tumor. They take it out. Patients, you know, just hang out for a couple hours for the anesthesia to wear off and they go home. So it's a same day outpatient procedure. Uh, so now you can do that for liver cancer, kidney cancer, lung cancer, a lot of cancers, right? Um, I'm sorry, you know, I don't know, maybe, oh, you know, we'll see it again when we do kidneys, um, but, um, sorry, so this is one of the quiz questions, so we have free air here, this is confirmed on CT, um, here is the pancreatitis, which we talked about already, here, what do you think, so lines and tubes, I'll help. here we have um, this line here, which is what, what is this line, coming down the, Swans and is that in the good good position? Yes, good. And what this line here is um, an IJ line, right? So and it's going in the right atrium, which is which is okay. It's not great, but that's okay. It's not too deep. If it's too deep, then it'll start causing arrhythmias. Um, here we have oh, here's the mediastinal drain. So the patient is status post like a 
surgery, mean sinus surgery. And here is another um, catheter. Uh, I think this is outside. And then here is this other line. What is this line here? Is that normal? Is this where it should be? Yes, no. What is it? Any thoughts? It's a feeding tube. Good. And where is that feeding tube? Not in the right place. That's exactly right, Colin. It's in left me bracket, so this has to be removed and repositioned. Um, here is an example of um, a, like air in the retrocardiac region. Um, and a common cause of air in the retrocardiac region is a hydrohernia. That's when part of the stomach herniates into the thoracic cavity. Uh, and so that's what we see here. CT colonography is a, a screening test for colon cancer. Uh, it's endorsed by the U.S. Preventative Task Force. Um, so screening for colon cancer, you can. there's three ways to do it. You can either do a colonoscopy every 10 years, you can do a CTC every five years, or you can do a flexic with fecal occult blood test every five years. Okay? So the nice thing about this is that it's non-invasive. It's just a scan. So you still have to go through the bowel prep, and then what we do is we uh, insufflate the colon. This is covered by Medicare, so patients can get it because um, it's endorsed by... U.S. Preventative Task Force, um, and then you insufflate it, and then you can reconstruct the images. So you get this virtual colonoscopy. They call this virtual CTC colonoscopy, um, and then you can, um, you know, screen for polyps. You can look for a thickening, and you can also like find incidental findings. Okay, so this is now one of the three things, I guess, four things that you can do uh, for, to screen for colon cancer. Um, ultrasound. Okay, let's talk about ultrasound. So ultrasound is great uh, if you have a good window. Uh, it's great for right quadrant pain, pelvis, pelvic pain, uh, and children, of course. Um, now we have ultrasound with contrast. Um, it's not really off label. It's actually FDA approved now uh, as of last year. Uh, so ultrasound with contrast is with CO2. So it's nice because you just breathe it out. So Patients who have renal failure, you can give, you know, it, it's, it acts like contrast, like CT. So you can look for enhancement, wash out, all of that stuff. And now we also use it for biopsies, uh, procedures to find lesions that are hard to see without contrast. Here's an example of contrast enhanced ultrasound. Oh, oh my gosh, what is going on here? Uh, oh. I think I get these videos from the same person, and for some reason that person has removed his videos, and I'm so bummed because his videos are so good. <sighs> okay, I'm sorry. Here, I want to find another one because this is important. Um, you guys need to know about this. Okay, so here, this is contrast ultrasound, right? So this is ultrasound, but now you see it's bright because they've injected. Cold. I'm so bummed. I can't show you the video that I had originally, but it's okay. Here we see this is a grayscale, right? So there's different ways that we could contrast. One is grayscale. You just look at the anatomy. Another one is Doppler, where you can look at flow. And now we can do contrast. Um, so here it's with contrast. Oh, it's a nice like, live video. So here we have, um, they're giving contrast. So it goes into the vessels and then boom, look at that mass, right? You can't, it's kind of hard to see here, but you see something here, but now with the contrast, it just lights up. So um, at USC, this is now their primary way of characterizing livers because the county is, you know, it's cheaper than MR. So um, it's, it's as good. So they, they now just do contrast enhanced ultrasound um, for most of the liver imaging stuff. Uh, but you can, you know, apply this to anywhere, right? Kidney cancer, um, the pediatric people love it to look for reflux in children because there's no radiation. Um, the peds, peds love it. Okay. Um, uh, this is ultrasound elastography. Um, this is, uh, we're looking for stiffness of the liver. Remember, you know, patients with diffuse liver disease, they are at risk for developing uh, fib fibrosis, and there's four stages, um, F1, F2, F3, F4, F4 is cirrhosis, which is end-stage fibrosis, but now they can treat F2, F3, 
So they have medications now to stop, halt fibrosis. So, but in order for you to get the medication, you need to be either F2 or F3. You can't get it if you're F4. So now they um, do ultrasound lithography to assess, uh, to stage it. So um, they basically um, sample the liver here, like multiple places, and then they can measure the stiffness. Um, so it's important because liver fibrosis is very common and now we can actually treat it. So you can um, do different ways to assess the fib fibrosis of it. So this is how the ultrasound works. So uh, they use this thing called, it's an ARFI. Um, and what it basically sends these vibrations into the liver and causes tissue displacement. So you can see here, right, as it transmits, it causes it. So you can imagine the liver just like jiggling. And so you can measure how much it jiggles, like measure the distance. And so that jiggling, so patients with stiff liver, um, they're very stiff because it's fibrotic. And so you can measure the stiffness. You could do that either with ultrasound or with MR. So MR, you do the same thing. So you have an external coupler that essentially sends vibrations. So that's what we're looking at, these waves. Um, and then as as you see the waves, they can then be reconstructed to create this elastogram. Um, so the red part tells you it's really, really, it's cirrhosis basically. The blue parts are like F1, the yellow parts are F2, F3. Uh, and here's a color spectrum. The red is worse, uh, purple is, you know, it's soft. Like, so you, the fat, for example, is purple. So this is, this has supplanted biopsies. So hepatologists no longer get liver biopsies, they just get MR elastographies or ultrasound elastography to stage the patients. Because you can imagine if you put a biopsy here, right? This is, if you biopsy here versus here, you're gonna get com two completely different staging because you're just undersampling. Um, so with imaging, you can um, get a more accurate assessment. And this is now endorsed. So if you have a patient with chronic liver disease and you wanna diagnose fibrosis, you know, because if they have it, then they can get medications to halt it. Then you can get MR. So the question from Kathy is, which one? Which one is this one again? Um, so I'm assuming you're talking about this one. And uh, this is MRI, MRI lastography. It's better than ultrasound. Um, so the American College of Radiology says if you want to diagnose fibrosis, you want to get an MRE, not I mean, ultrasound is fine too with the ARFI that we saw, but you want to get MRE if, if available. And this one is also, there's also a CPT code now. So then you like, hopefully soon Medicare will cover it. Um, so this was one of our questions. What is a study? This is an MRI elastography to look for fibrosis. So that's it. Um, that's 